TFL International is a project designed by Studio Bad in 2002 for a firm of interior designers who at the time based in Preston but looking for a new office, a new place to work that would represent their own values and ideas and agenda and ethos as a team of designers. And one of the reasons I've selected this building to um, profile, to have a conversation about, to discuss with the architect is its ability to elevate a very simple brief, um, a very ordinary budget and a very um, ordinary site to something really quite magical and something quite special and something that I feel stands the test of time. It's really a kind of an idea of something extraordinary in quite ordinary settings and ordinary situations. It has a, a, a kind of character born out of its simplicity uh, that consists of just simple, bold design moves, large pink gates, uh, an external mesh line terrace, the large cow wall um, facade to, to, the, to the main entrance in the street that, that I'm stood in front of at the moment, and then weaves them into something that actually has a real generosity. It has a, 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 a sense of offering a place of delight, a place of joy, um, and not just a productive place to work, but also a very social place to work. And it's those um, ideas about what it is to, to be in an office and be away from the desk and to spend time with the people you work with um, and to spend time considering what you do rather than just sitting there and doing it. Uh, that has been one of the kind of main drivers that has influenced the development of this design for its architect, Philip Lindliff. For me, and one of the main reasons I tracked you down and got in touch and invited did you have to be a part of part of this conversation was I suppose a reflection on my own journey from coming from Preston and going to study architecture um, in in Glasgow and at the time feeling very very much like you know well well actually not just feeling like but I actually had to get out of Preston to study architecture you know there was there wasn't an opportunity or a possibility to study it in Preston and also a sense that there wasn't necessarily anything in Preston of a contemporary nature that was exciting anyway. So the kind of draw of a bigger city, a bigger place was was something that appealed to me at the time. And having also over the last two and a half years been running an architecture course in Preston and actually coming back to Preston because a school of architecture has been established here and wanting to be a part of that and to help grow it and nurture it then, then it felt like a really good opportunity to, to have a conversation um, about what it is to produce architecture and create architecture in, in places like Preston. Um, I remember opening up the Architects Journal, that um, very issue that's in front of us, and seeing TfL International and being blown away by the fact that there was this cool building in my hometown um, that was in, in that was in the worst bit of my hometown as well. It was like on on the docks and amongst this kind of relentless, banal, out of town office. Like the Preston Docks is a really strange, strange place. You know, it's kind of a, a place of infinite opportunity that has has, has been um, you know dealt a pretty nasty blow in terms of what's been built there. And then there's this pink and black cow wall jewel, as I saw it in amongst all that um, and so I was at the time I was especially inspired by um, the fact that there was this really interesting and intriguing piece of architecture in this part of Preston and I was really inspired and intrigued by the fact that it had been created by a practice also in, in the north of England also located in a small town um, a practice that um, was doing interesting work um, and innovative work and, um, and all that led, led me to you. I suppose like the first thing to to ask yourself then is is really how did that as a project come about um, for you and in, in your office and, and and where did it come in terms of the kind of situation and journey of that your own practices kind of uh, I suppose progress at that point as well. At the time, I doubt 
didn't really want to do architecture so I was doing graphics and a few months in um, the director from TFL I, I didn't know him at the time but I got a phone call one evening from this chap who said could he come and see me I said well when do you think he said well now I'm on my way and I said well all right what, what's it about he said well I need a model making well I used to say I, I did presentation drawings and models but I did very specific models they had to be geometric they had to be crisp and white and silver yeah. and I had a little format for doing them and I thought well if he wants a silver model with this I could probably do it and I was, I was imagining what was going to happen but way off the mark because when he turned up he said I was just asking around who could help with this project and Somebody you must have worked with said, well, I know somebody who's man enough to have a go at that. So at that point that you'd met them, that you were set up predominantly as a, as, as a visual communication yeah, company yeah. yourself for doing uh, graphics and model making yeah. and drawing and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and that, then, that, that relationship, how does that, how does that then transition from, I suppose, them being a client of yours as um, someone who's creating presentation material to then actually starting to, well, get to design a building, design their headquarters. Well, I mean, in the first, the first while, the first little while that I knew them, I never mentioned architecture and I just used to do drawings for them for the various projects that we were working on. And they eventually discovered, worked out that I had an architectural background and then were keen to move to move out of the offices that we're in yeah. and said what about doing an office so uh, that, that was the start of it really and it was the, the they had a plan to buy the site to buy the building to kit it out and that was to be their kind of flagship headquarters and they worked for major names like Hilton and they wanted a building that stood out for them so that their clients knew they, they were interested in design. Yeah, and I suppose the, that aim at the outset then was always to create a building that said something of design, said something of the people who inhabited that building as well. And a kind of project that was yeah. trying to take whatever TFL, I suppose, wanted to project of themselves at that time and pop that into architecture in some way. So what, what was the kind of key moves for you in realising that ambition from the, from the client? You, it, I got to know them as this pretty dynamic team. They would make presentations as I, as I tried to, and they, but they were making them to national, international clients and they could do perspectives of wolf colours and talk about design. So they, they were kind of an educated client, but they were, they were doing it as well as mm -hmm. talking about it. Yeah. So I, th I really enjoyed them. I really enjoyed the company and I thought they were great people. So when we started to work on the building, I wanted the building to somehow, in, well, in, my turn i just wanted to do something that expressed what i kind of thought of them you said you'd spent quite a bit of time both working with them and, and and socially up to that point and kind of had already in yourself a kind of idea of of, of what that architecture should be to, to project something that you you weren't just being told but you actually then knew you know and, and what what was the key um i suppose yeah not, not even because as a building, you know, it's, it's, it's modest in its form, but it's very generous in its space, it's generous in its, in its volume. The material palette, again, is, is, is limited, but again, every time something is used, it's used in a very specific way as well. Um, where, where did you kind of start in translating that idea of what TFL were into, into a building design? There was always this... I think, I think one of the conversations that we had early on was... You know, we've got this opportunity. We could have our name. We could do we could yeah. have a sign. We could we could brand it. We could, and it's us, so people will know who we are. Yeah. And there was a limited budget, and 
my thought was that the materials could maybe do a job so we didn't have to pay extra for a sign yeah the materials could be the sign yeah so you know if you're driving past just look out for the white building on your left yeah and it, it was an easy kind of route to follow it was the only white building yeah and it's still the only white building <laughs> so, <laughs> it's still the only white building for sure yeah but uh, and uh, there, there were other things growing uh, smoking areas you had just become a thing where companies had to allow smokers to smoke but usually they were a kind of smokers being on the wall by this entrance and you'd see a group of unhappy people <laughs> out in the corner in the wet yeah and so we had to do the same thing and said well why don't we make it a deck when we can sit down and you know mm -hmm. everyone can enjoy the weather and enjoy the view the sunshine the and so they became in a way it's a key move so, you know that's the front and the back yeah the white wall to the, the white street wall to the street and then the the kind of sheltered deck to the rear to the, to the south but i had this idea at the time as well that um to make the best of a budget we'd have to shrink wrap the accommodation and so we had to kind of have a, a, an idea of how much accommodation we needed how how we could afford to build it and it had to be maybe a kind of industrial based building because sheds are so cheap mm -hmm. um, and then if we could we could hire we could reserve a little sum of money for a flourish of some kind but the building was a, as rectangular a shrink wrap to the accommodation as it could be so the section of the building you talk about the building as a very simple object and um and your own attitude to to try to make the building work within what was a really really tight budget and like you say you've got this white wall to the street you've got this terrace to the south um but caught in between that is is a very generous series and sequence of spaces like my kind of experience entering the building is one that's immediately about uh, natural light about double height space about volume about immediately being able to orientate myself in the building kind of see where everything is as well so for, for, for all that kind of attempt to create this kind of really tight tight floor plan it doesn't feel like a mean building when you're inside it I mean, what was the and it, you've kind of got the workspace on the first floor and then on the ground floor you've got kind of the, the shared accommodation I suppose whether that's meeting space or social space or, or bathrooms um, etc but again how, how did you get that generosity inside even at the same time that you were really really trying to tighten it as an object and as a footprint somehow there was a there was a kind of idea that historic buildings were the only buildings with with interest, you know, they had little niches, they had yeah. little fireplaces, they had a bay. But I used to think that modern buildings could be as full of incident if you worked at it. A simple idea like security for the building, uh, we could try to elaborate that beyond an alarm system yeah so it's not a, a blue flashing light on the outside so security became the gates and they became double height so it had this kind of it's <laughs> completely the wrong thing to say but they had this kind of majesty about it you know like kind of a big gate you know yeah. wow, how big is that and i get to that's where I work, that's, that's where I get to do these things. And I, I had this idea that um, somehow if you could uh, s strike a pose, like a, an uplifting attitude, yeah. maybe you'd be uplifted. So the idea that you'd walk into a space and look upwards and it was a kind of hopeful wow look at this this is interesting it's better than looking at the floor and kind of looking 
kind of crestfallen down and here. And everything does that because, like you say, like the the glazed roof above you and that whole basically like a linear atrium, I suppose, as you kind of enter the building. And there is that, there is a kind of moment of, the pink gates are a moment of wow anyway, <laughs> just as a, as a visual motif on, on the building. Uh, and I've, I've now had the pleasure of opening and closing those pink gates as well. And, and the, 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 the heavy, but they're not, but there's something pleasing actually about, like you, you know you're doing something serious, you know, like actually the kind of act of opening that building and closing it up um, has um, something of an experience that does seem kind of more meaningful. When you were talking before about, I suppose, the, 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 the smoking and the smoking area um, being actually something that all of a sudden becomes an interesting driver for, for design or a reason to create a terrace. There's quite a few things with this project where the, um, you know, for, for a place of work where actually the stuff that you, you're doing when you're not working is a key part of the design. So like the terrace, but also then the bathrooms and the, and the wash area as well. The sinks are on, you know, on show, basically, but then you've also got quite a large, generous mirror there as well. And also they go kind of like right at the end of that kind of, the, the, I suppose, um, at the end of the view when you kind of come into the, the building as well. It's just a kind of like hint um, of, of, of the sinks. And even that, I think, also builds on, a bit on the idea of not needing signage you know you talk about the, the building itself didn't need signage because it actually was the sign it was the symbol and I, I find a lot of aspects inside the building to be like that as well actually you don't need toilets and an arrow stuck on a wall to kind of know yeah you know, because you see the sinks and they're there as objects and you don't need offices up the stairs because you can hear it you know you yeah. can't come in yeah. and you hear people working upstairs so a lot of that kind of activity of a workplace that ends up being the yeah, being the signage, being the way you orientate yourself as well. In, in a way, the, those kind of ideas transfer to the building where you think, well, at least I can have an idea that I might use out. I might use the outside terrace. I might go and sit there for a quiet moment in the sunshine. Yeah. And I might never, yeah. but at least I've got the chance to do that if, if it seems right for me. So it was trying to use things in a way that people could surround themselves with perceptions of luxury or perceptions of activity that they may never take advantage of or they may. I mean, one thing I noticed upstairs is there's a large open plan workspace and then there's kind of two offices either end that, that look onto it. I mean, was that um, part of a design decision to... Who, who had those offices? <laughs> who, who had the... Uh... Well, uh, I... I'd, I'd say I, I don't know that they were there originally. Right, okay. Instead of being obsessed with privacy, you know, people overhearing what you were saying or what you were talking about, we sort of dealt with that by putting everyone together so no one could no one could hear what was going on. Yeah. You know, the person over there, you couldn't hear what they were saying on the phone because there was somebody else there, there talking at the same time. So we didn't need sign. We didn't need offices for privacy. We just had the shield, the shelter of the background noise. So this is a building where it's supposed affordability seems to have been a big part of the the, the conversation. And so you know, the fact that it was built for only two hundred seventeen thousand um, pounds kind of crops up time and again in conversation. Just how affordable um, and how kind of intelligent the design has been to achieve that type of budget, but. For, for whatever reason, not everyone has been convinced by that cost and convinced by that, that price. And even when it was submitted to the AJ Small Projects Award, they also came back to, didn't they, and kind of questioned the legitimacy of this £217,000 figure. So how did you, how did you convince them? Well, we, we didn't know. I mean, we, we were asked to submit the project and we didn't realise, well, we wouldn't know, but the, the AJ had a QS on their jury. And I, I got a phone call on the day that they, they'd had a look at the project and they said, sorry, we've had to you know, uh, discount your project because the QS didn't believe it could be built for that. And so the client got the information that sent it to the AJ and they 
kind of they, they've relented and they used to think we've only spent half what this building looks like it costs yeah, yeah. so with, with an award winning really affordable building why isn't there loads more of the docks <laughs> Or, 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 well, you know, did anyone ask? Did anyone ask you to, to do any any other work on the docks or in that area? No, we we built another similar but larger building uh, nearby, not far from Preston, and um, the contractor that built it. Um, they used to take their customers to see the building they'd done for our client and they said this is our latest job but we can also do sheds with coloured flashings so yeah. they used to use the project that we designed as a kind of sales tool to sell more brown sheds with <laughs> Draw them in with your work and then flog them something uh, so that there was a mediocre. There was, there was, a, yeah. there was an, an irony. <laughs> but um, I mean, in a way, you'd say, thank goodness there aren't more of them because it's, it's still standing. I mean, you, see, you say that, but, see, I, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of look at, I, say, I, I walk around the docks and I see exceptionally uninteresting sheds of a variety of scales and, and wish there was more buildings like that one and then yeah I totally understand that desire on the part of the architect to kind of be able to say I've got I've got the special one here I've kind of got the <laughs> I'm responsible for the for the one piece of magic in this in this neck of the woods but I, I think you know it is, it is I think yeah a single kind of piece of magic in that area as I was saying before and I was wondering like what 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 the ingredients have to be to make that happen? I mean, you've already mentioned that you've got a client who um, were, were design led anyway. You know, it's a client who were a team of designers. They're kind of receptive. Yeah, you know, they, so they're immediately receptive. You've got yourself. Um, you've got an architect who's um, ambitious about what you want to achieve, progressive in the way you want to achieve it. I think you'd also mentioned there was someone in the council at that time as well who seemed to be yeah. keen to push. Yeah, to, yeah. Because that's another thing that I, I find, and again, especially in places like, like Preston or smaller towns or smaller cities that don't have um, the kind of hotbed of architectural talent or don't necessarily have... I, th I think at the time, I mean, maybe Preston Council were pretty progressive themselves because I think... Uh, design champions right, okay. were a kind of new thing came had come in and there was, there was much more so that was in the national language at that time there was kind of much more interest in yeah. design and Preston was saying well how do we deal with this and they actually put the money where the mouth is they, they appointed a design champion and I met him and he said well yeah, yeah that, that looks alright to me I'll tell them so he could go, to, good. He could go, to, he could go to the uh -huh. planning department and be our champion yeah so in that way, that, that was our favourite thing, that if we could kind of get the planning department to be part of our team, because the, the unknowns are always planning committees. You know, you, kind of, you can do as much design as you like. When it goes to planning committee, the outcome's never clear. No. But to have the planning committee working for you and a, a design champion who's receptive as well, perfect kind of combination. Because I think, I mean, that's something I'd certainly be interested in seeing growing as an idea, um, especially places like Preston and, and Blackpool, Barry, Rochdale, place, places that aren't necessarily big cities or places that aren't necessarily associated, immediately associated with a, with a design culture. And something I think that's quite interesting in architecture at the moment is, is well, mainly and more so in London, I'm seeing a lot of people of, of my age and younger who have studied architecture now moving back into the public sector uh, to, to work. You know, so I mean, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, most architects worked within the council, yeah, yeah. the whole thing became pretty much, you know, 99% privatised as a pr profession from, from the 80s until now. And now I'm seeing more and more people actually heading into, um, you know, working for local authorities, working in a way where they're able to take their, um, 
design training, architectural training, experience in practice, into a role of and, and commissioning and, and, and advocacy. Love of an area. Yeah. They're, they're, they're building in their own home town, their own district, and they're building with the knowledge of that. I mean, that's, that, that always seemed very positive to me. But sadly, councils had to rethink the budgets, so the council's design departments were an easy thing to get rid of. Yeah. Um, Move into the private sector. But I think having having that on board at that, that time clearly was was it was a was an asset to the to the project. You also did um, did quite a lot of work in Hebden Bridge itself, and I mean Hebden Bridge is uh, a, a smaller place than, than than Preston is. And I'm kind of sat here being like, oh, Preston isn't isn't a massive city, isn't a big city. It's, it's potentially a, a more difficult place to produce work or do work or set up a practice. But, but Hebden Bridge seems like an even more, you know, kind of unique situation within which to not just set up a practice, but also to establish it and to grow it and to, I suppose, create work within its immediacy and its context as well. How, how did you end up in Hebden Bridge and, and, and how did you find that process of setting up and, and growing a practice out with, you know, the, the, the big city or out with somewhere that, people might more usually associate with a, a, a location for a kind of progressive contemporary practice. The first job I got, I started on the same day as a guy from Hebden Bridge. Right. And at half past 12, we looked around and everyone in the office had gone out for lunch and there were just the two of us. So we went out for lunch. And so we kind of got thrown together, never met each other, didn't know anything about each other's interests. And as we got on, I would, he, he would invite me out to his place um, and him and his wife showed me around Hebden Bridge and say, that's a good street, that's, a, yeah. that's not so good, that's interesting, that's got a view of that. He was the best at, estate agent I've ever, <laughs> ever come across. So in the end, when I was looking for somewhere to live and to move out of my rented flat, I just knew more about Hebden Bridge because I could see an address in the newspaper and think, well, I'm, the pub's down there, the, the bus you stop's there. You've already been, you've been sold. So, so I gravitated to Hebden Bridge. And then when I was deciding to mm, set up in practice, there was never a thought of, of commuting to somewhere else to have an office. Yeah, so to, to be in Manchester, not, yeah, not in Manchester or anywhere. Yeah. And so it had to be a kind of homespun kind of thing with all the dire warnings that I suppose people gave me with the best of intentions. Um, the planning department were intrigued in a way. Well, I'll say intrigued. But I, the, the, one of the first meetings I went to in the planning department, the planner I was seeing said, where are you based? I said, well, Hebden Bridge. And he said, well, Hebden Bridge, that's, that's so up into There's three architects there already. Yeah. And so there was, they, they, there was this concern. And the other comment I got was, you'll never get any staff there. I mean, so, you know, where, where are you going to find So, so the dire warnings were... Yeah, yeah. There's, well, already, there's already enough people doing that in that area and you're never going to get anyone wanting to work in Hebden Bridge. But... I mean, you'd say it, it, it was it was a two-edged thing when it came to employment. Um, we used to give anybody a chance. You know, anybody that came to Hebden Bridge, any, um, and if if they were within a bus ride, they automatically automatically almost got a job. <laughs> So if they could if they could walk to the office, and we had people who lived on barges, we had people who lived in the next village, the people who grew up in the next village, and who turned out to be absolute kind of the diamonds, you know, they yeah. were brilliant people. We had um, a guy who came to us who graduated. And he'd spent six months looking for a job. He hadn't got a job. He came for the interview and we were intrigued to see his work and looked at it and said, well, 
with the whatever it is, you need a job. So you, you, you know, we, we, so we, we would always give people had a chance to work in the office for a week, right, or, or two weeks maybe. And if we liked them and they liked us, then it became a job, and it uh, it failed once or twice, but only on a handful of a handful of occasions. And people had to bring their favourite CDs in. We had to know what music they liked, yeah. and it was a kind of social experience as well as you know, un- just getting a sense of what an office could be like. I mean, that, that was interesting. You said about how you found these kind of diamonds in that area, you know, as well. But, but we weren't looking for diamonds. Yeah, we would almost say anybody can get a job, and then they turned out to be diamonds. But it's interesting because that, that's something that. Again, now I'm teaching in Preston and having kind of come from um, a situation where most of my teaching was at the Macintosh School of Architecture. And most most of the students, I'd say most of the students I taught in the time I was there ended up in London or ended up uh, abroad after we'd finished with them. You know, and there's a certain point where I'm kind of going, what? What am I doing this? Like, who, who am I doing this for? What am I doing this for? Like, why, why aren't they staying in Glasgow? Why aren't they setting up practices in Glasgow? Why aren't they kind of... And, and that's in a big city like, like Glasgow. Now I'm in Preston. It, it feels really, really important to try and... Um, in, a, in a real way, you're involved in running an architecture school, not just to be thinking about what you're creating in terms of the student, but also how you're also able to support practice within that locale as well and support the development and the culture of practice in that locale. So that those people that you were talking about who are kind of sat there in and around Hebden Bridge at that time, wondering if they'll get a job or and if they do get a job, if it will be somewhere interesting where they can do some interesting work, actually have an outlet for that somewhere somewhere nearby. And it seems like that might not have been your, your intention when you set up in Hebden Bridge, but it sounds like you were able to provide something there that maybe those three other practices who had sewn up all the attic conversions in the area. You know, if some of those people who'd come with you had ended up in some of those other practices out of just pure necessity, then it's like their own outlook and their own careers then all of a sudden maybe become quite quite different. We were lucky with people that we got to work in the office and we got people who went on to work for Renzo Piano, Norman Foster, uh, you know, so in a way, having worked with this flaky outfit out in the sticks yeah. <laughs> didn't seem to limit the, the careers of these people. And, and you were always quite happy to be that stepping stone as well as that kind of outlet for local people as well. Well, in a, in a way, it was some. It was a strange. It was some kind of validation because at least with because we had nothing to measure ourselves by, so we thought, well, we must be doing something right. Yeah, somebody, so if you saw them move on to those if somebody, practices, if somebody yeah. thinks our staff are good enough yeah. to do that job, then there's got to be something we're doing right. So it was just another of these little circular arguments that seemed to work at the time. Well, it was clearly. A few things that you were doing, right? When, when, when I mentioned you to uh, Ellis Woodman um, as, as, and the building as being what I wanted to profile and talk about, um, he recalled that he'd been kind of researching back into the Architecture Foundation archives and you actually you, you brought the uh, publication that he'd been looking at at that time when I brought this up, which was the New British Architecture magazine, which I think has then subsequently become the now four editions of New Architects, New Architects 1, New Architects 2, New Architects 3, recently New Architects 4 coming out. But I think that this was like the first um, attempt by the Architecture Foundation to, to take young practices at any given moment and try and profile them and, and, and promote them. And you're in there amongst 11 other um, really interesting groups and people. And again, how, how did that... Re- how, in what, how did that recognition kind of come about, given, your, again, your own, your own situation in, in Hebden Bridge, working in a very specific kind of way, in a specific kind of context? It was kind of like a secret club. Right. You didn't know what you had to do to qualify. You didn't know why you'd qualified, but we were included. Yeah. A mystery. Yeah, <laughs> that's quite, it's quite a good mystery to have. I mean, there's, 
part of the story that's important to hear and important to tell that, yeah, like, like I said before, you, you don't need to let your geography and your circumstance kind of dictate and define what you do and, and how you do it. Thank you.